So while this is rebooting, anything you guys want to talk about? Yes, Flash on 64-bit Linux. No, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually kind of funny because 64-bit Flash really doesn't work on anything except Linux, but even there it doesn't work very good. I'm an official volunteer for Linux West Northwest, a science bit assisting with projectors. You want to give it a try? All right. All right, and we're only going to go at this from the very pragmatic point of view. And of course, the whole point of this is that Linux sucks. Of course, we all like Linux, and that's why we're here. Um, but let's try and not think about this from the point of view of any sort of <coughs> morality or open freeness or anything like that. Let's just look at this from why does Linux suck and what exactly, very specifically, do we do to fix it? And not in a general sense of the word, not in... Um, oh, we're, we're, we're lacking a specific piece of functionality in a particular application, so obviously since it's open source, go and fix it. That just doesn't fly because, I mean, the ratio of people that are going to be developers is going to be high amongst this group. How many people among you have had an issue with OpenOffice and you fixed it? Any? One? Two? Two. Okay. That's pretty good. Okay, so two out of however many people this is. So odds are, so for the rest of us then, Linux and OpenOffice then suck because we aren't going to actually do that. So we need to actually look at specifically how it is that we're going to be able to fix these issues, what are these issues, and uh, what can we do in the immediate to short term to make it all happen. Starting with external displays and multiple monitor configuration. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, hey, it was working at home. <laughs> all right. Um, Man, it made really pretty slides, too. So far, every session has had at least five minutes. Of doing this? Of doing this. Every See, session. Not that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so, this is, all right, so this is like slide number 30 in my presentation, but let's just jump right to this. So, so Xorg sucks. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Xorg sucks. I support a Linux lab with... 15 workstations, three of which are triple monitor workstations. Yeah. Every time I do a Linux update and I um, install a new kernel, which is once a month, yeah. I have to rerun the NVIDIA drivers and I have to follow a very specific um, set of multi-step directions right. to get um, the video driver to work again with this three monitor setup. Yeah, it was Yeah. And sure. so, so not only did I take the entire night and do all my updates, but the next morning I'm there in the Linux lab doing this thing at the console. And I have Before to do it people at can the even console. get started doing what they need to do for the day. Right. Exactly. And it's, it's a multi pronged problem. And um, basically, basically, the heart of the issue is so, I mean, Almost. It centered it. That was cool. Um, the, the heart of the problem is that, for one thing, um, the fact that we have a combination of open source and closed source video drivers. That's one of the big issues. Another issue is the driver model we use itself in Linux is inherently flawed when you come to terms with having mm, like more than occasional updates. Then the third issue, of course, is let's say you have, you're running Ubuntu. Ubuntu likes to update the kernel randomly, seemingly, on me, and uh, then I have to reapply all of my various drivers. Hey. Uh, it's on the desktop somewhere. Here, just do like a sort by name or whatever on the desktop. Yeah, I got it. I got it. I got it. Hold tab for something? We'll survive. It's under system. Thank you, Duder. <laughs> yeah. All right, come on down. I'd just like to add, I never saw anybody have these kind of problems with Windows. It's freaking out on me right now. All right, there we go. And you suck. Yay. Uh, really? 
Really? All right, we'll just, uh, really? <laughs> you farting with me right now? <laughs> this was on purpose, all right? Oh. Hmm. Mm. This is for the pain. I you wish, know, you're, you're I wish to ever loving God. So you're, on, you're on the, like, the fourth desktop. Is that, that what the problem is? To the other one. There we go. Hey, Comp is this cool. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, hey, hey, there it is. There yeah. we go. Yeah. Yeah. Nicely done. <laughs> Alright, so I just have to uh, do the compass switch every time I switch to slides. That's fine, we'll roll with it. Alright, okay, here we go. Alright, so, um, again, let's get this out of the way. We all like Linux, there's a lot, a lot of reasons we like Linux. Let's skip over all of that. We don't really care. Alright, so, everyone amongst us, and if you say no to this, you're absolutely lying. You've had audio problems with audio playback. Right now, what the hell? No. <laughs> Sometimes you've had them. Wi-Fi issues. Most of us have had problems getting either our Wi-Fi drivers to work or just connecting to a Wi-Fi network. Yeah. Um, Everybody has those problems. Kernel updates. Oh, hold on, hold on. Questions at the end. Uh, <laughs> kernel updates, again, breaking things like existing drivers or just other uh, things updating. And of course, the, the huge problem of a lack of software for particular tasks. So, <coughs> so we're not going to go into Linux as a server, mobile Linux, or embedded Linux. Uh, because honestly, in my personal opinion, Linux is a rock star in all three of those areas. We're going to specifically talk about Linux as a desktop operating system right now. We're also not going to talk about marketing, which uh, Canonical, Novell, uh, Red Hat have all basically screwed the pooch on repeatedly over and over again, um, where they've had amazing opportunities, but we're not going to get into that because that's not something that all of us can help uh, those companies and these groups address directly. There we go. All right, audio problems. Almost every distribution seems to like to use a completely different audio framework. You have applications like, you know, video conferencing and audio chat applications. Skype is a great example of one that people use a lot. Um, you know, Akiga and that sort of thing. Um, how many times have you been running one of those applications? It somehow basically locks up the, the, the audio port and no other application can then use your audio input or your audio output anymore. Amen. The problem is, for one thing, the audio subsystems are different amongst multiple distributions. But to make matters far worse is the frameworks that those applications use is also different. So you've got multiple applications attempting to use different sets of frameworks to, to interact with the same resources on the system and explosions occur. It, it can get very, very bad. It's ridiculous. And there's some amazing projects out there to address them. Phonon is great. GStreamer is great. Uh, they're great stuff, but this is just really, really ridiculous. So let's just fix it. Just call it fixed right off the bat. And no more duplicating effort. No more, and sorry anyone who's a KDE fan in here, no more phone on, uh, which, uh, things like that. Um, no more additional uh, uh, sound frameworks. Let's just kill it off right there and just say, here, let's use GStreamer and um, whatever uh, sound framework is working on beneath GStreamer, call it good. If every distro got together, let's just say uh, Canonical, Red Hat, and Novell got together and said, yeah, you know what, we agree on that both for GNOME and KDE desktops, we're just going to use GStreamer, call it good, and most major applications went ahead and used it, those issues would go away. It, the problem is that we're duplicating effort, we have multiple projects out there doing the same thing. And normally, that's a great thing. But in the terms of interacting with your hardware, it sucks. So, I'm going to kind of blaze through this because there's a lot of stuff we've got to hit. All right, uh, hardware issues. I kind of grouped all these together, and this is what we were talking about earlier. Um, and there's a lot of problems when you're talking about dealing with hardware issues. And we're not just saying things like multiple monitor support, um, you know, 3D driver support for, for cards that have proprietary drivers, uh, wireless drivers, these sorts of things. The problem goes much deeper than that, in that the software, a lot of times, that is interacting with those drivers is older than the crustiest old shoe I have at my house. Xorg is awesome. It served us very, very well, but it is very, very old, and it is a very huge code base. It is very difficult for the Xorg developers, despite the fact that they've done a great job, to constantly keep that working and keep it cutting edge on modern hardware. 
So it works great if you're just going with an old 2D graphics card and you don't want Compass, you don't want KWIN, you don't want all the effects, it works great. But then you end up with projects like Compass and Compass Fusion that basically have to essentially use XORG and hack XORG to be able to do things that are modern. So that's an issue. I don't know exactly how to fix that one. That's the only one I'm not going to go in on how to fix because it means scrapping XORG. X XORG is being completely rewritten and the framework is being completely redone. And There's, they're well aware of the law. They, they know what it is. And that's why you know I, I'm not going to get too hard on the XORG guys because honestly, they've done a phenomenal job with what they've got to work with. So, and of course... When you're fixing the multi stuff, it's getting fixed. See? It's going to be better than the next round of distribution screen tell you this year or two down the road it'll be better for NVIDIA or Perfect. There you go. See that? Very simple. Uh, and of course, there is another problem. And that is, I have an HP little Mini 1000. It's a great little netbook. Ubuntu 8.10, it worked perfect out of the box. Ubuntu 9.04, sound stops working. <laughs> it's Wait a minute, a that's going in the wrong direction. <laughs> you notice that too. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah. let's start, let's start with, with the basics here. Uh, the distributions, um, I won't point any fingers, <coughs> Ubuntu and whatnot, um, need to stop revving XORG so often. They need to pick and choose, pick the stable branches, and call it good. Every, di every new version does not require a new build of the kernel and a new build of XORG. It just doesn't need it. XORG is working, the kernel is working. Stop breaking all of my drivers. Um, also, there needs to be a little bit more uh, actual testing going on. Um, if if distributions are shipping and claiming support for a piece of modern hardware that literally came out months prior, they can't six months later release a new version that can be easily upgraded that doesn't support that hardware. Um, if Microsoft or Apple did that, it would be top news on Dig and CNN that day about how awful Microsoft and Apple are. And see, all of us, we flame them for doing that. So we can't do that ourselves. We have to at least have some level of support. We have to continue to get better. And the same for wireless cards as well as video and sound and, and everything else. All right, so past that stuff. <coughs> Packaging is really awful. Um, so if you've ever tried to release a piece of software for Linux, you know you've got to not only hit the basic Debian package format and basic RPM, but there's also, you know, everything, uh, you've got Gen 2 you've got to hit, you've got Arch you've got to hit, you've got Slackware you've got to hit, and there's a lot of different targets you've got to hit. And even if you're just going to say, I'm going to build a Debian package for my software to get it out there, you really have to build separate Debian packages for Ubuntu, Debian, um, well, Mint works fine, but, but, you know, for a lot of different distributions, you're going to have to fork. So in the end, you end up with 10, 12. If you go to, Skype's a great example, if you go to Skype's download page, it's this giant matrix that you get to click on. Luckily, they have pretty pictures, but just the same. That is ridiculous. Um, it basically, and to make it, to make it worse, the really bad part is then you have really great people who have dev skills. Instead of developing new software, they're spending all of their time packaging someone else's software for a minor revision of the distribution that they work on. So at, at any given point, if we have 12 distributions, that means Half of this room is doing nothing but package maintenance for applications that have already been packaged elsewhere, which is really lame. Um, and it's too much d duplication of effort, and it really just doesn't need to happen. So, so what do you think about stuff like build services? OK. Um, Bring up OpenSUSE build services at the end. I'll bitch about that briefly. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, that sucker don't work. All right, so, um, so packaging. The Linux standard base, this is a great step in the right direction. Basically, it's, it's people coming together saying, here's the standard, here's what, let's just make every distribution based on this. You can deviate all you want as long as it's outside of this scope. And they said that RPM is the standard. I don't care if it's RPM, I don't care if it's Debian, I don't care if it's a text file with you know, a, a big hashed version of my application in it. It really doesn't matter. We just pick one, every distribution use it. Um, that would be awesome. Especially if we could have every distribution using it, because then it means that duplication of the repositories becomes very simple. So if you want to create a new distribution, you could borrow from Debian or Gentoo, it doesn't matter. You're just bringing in those, those their packages. So rolling your own is faster, and doing work is faster. Yeah? That gets rolled up a lot. My objection to that is that the difference between distribution is packages. If yes. every distribution uses the same packaging format, 
and say, thank you, you've eliminated 90% of the difference between distribution. I disagree, and I'll get into that briefly. <laughs> All right, so, but, but theoretically, if that happens, it makes it a lot easier for developers. Now, here's the really cold, hard truth. Most people use Ubuntu right now. If, if, I mean, based on all the web service an analyzing I've been able to do, of people downloading software, it seems to be about 90% of various versions of Ubuntu, probably 8.04 and forward. Um, now, that doesn't mean that the other distributions aren't great, but if you're a developer, open source or otherwise, and you want to hit the widest market possible without doing a whole lot of work, you're just going to make an Ubuntu dev and call it good which sucks for Slackware and all the RPM-based distros and everything. So really, it's just everyone would benefit with a nice set of standardized packages, and we all keep the same basic file structure and just call it. They can do what they want on top of that, and we'll get into that in a minute. So that would actually just solve that issue for the most part. Let's get into the real big problem and that is a lack of specific types of applications available for Linux. Specifically, let's get into audio editing. There are lots of audio editing products. If you've ever tried to sit down and make some music, uh, record an audio podcast, etc., cetera, uh, you quickly realize that most of the audio packages out there, while some of them are very good, Audacity is excellent, but is not capable of actually doing the actual professional production workflow that either a pro needs or even a hobbyist would need in order to get started. It's too difficult to learn, it's kind of buggy because, well, the developers have their own focus and all these sorts of things. Lots of great examples, Jokosher seemed like it had promise for a while, but it just kind of fit. Um, but what the, the problem here is, we don't have that application that we can point to. A Mac user can go and say, here, we got GarageBand, you can do your music or podcasts in it. On Windows, there's a bunch of different tools like Audition and the like. We don't have that. Um, and I'm going to kind of wrap a bunch of these into one thing. This is going to get <coughs> this is going to get fun in a second. All right. Um, so video editing. And when I say video editing, I don't mean the there there are commercial video editing packages available for Linux that cost in the thousands of dollars range, and that production shops use and pro shops use, and it is cool. Unfortunately, not all of us can afford a seven thousand dollar HP workstation on top of a four thousand dollar license just to tittle around with our <coughs> movies. Um, nothing we have currently on Linux cuts it, at, even a little. Um, there are some projects that get close. KDN Live is one of my personal favorites. PTV is getting closer as is Lives. But the reality is that their, their UI is kind of hokey. They're very, very buggy. Um, the, they don't support the vast majority of codecs properly. If you've ever tried to do uh, like HD Handycam work, it just doesn't work. Even though some of them say it kind of does, it doesn't. Um, plus, in most cases, just to be able to get these video packages to work, you can't use the ones in the repositories anyway. You've got to build from source. Nobody does that. Like seriously, in this room, how many of you have built your video editor from source? Hands? Great. So in the crowd that is the most likely to have ever even done that, there's like six. Awesome. <laughs> All right, let's combine that together a little bit here. So the core of this issue is that these are not simple. This is not, and I don't want to demean anyone's work on various other projects. This is not a package management tool. This is not even an office suite. Because to be honest, this can get far more complex far more quickly than even OpenOffice. These are very complex tools, and they require a huge investment of dedicated, really well-experienced developers. And this is where things are going to start going south. So the current open source development model has failed to deliver these advanced and necessary tools. That is just simply true. Now, there can be a lot of reasons that's true, and we can still say that it could do that, but as of yet, it has not, and the result is that when a average consumer, which includes me and pretty much everyone here, um, looks at a modern Linux desktop, and they look at what they can accomplish with it, it is not on par with mid-90s Windows or Mac systems because of a lack of available applications. Now, so how do we fix that? Well, in order to do it, we have to be able to fund those projects, either through donations or, or what have you. And the funding must be reliable enough that we can get great devs working full time on it to make it really happen. A great example is Ardour, and I'm gonna come back to that very briefly. 
All right, before we get into that, I want to talk about a few other applications. So a lot of applications are things that people need either at their day job or like let's say they're an entrepreneur and they need to do graphics work. They freaking need Photoshop. Um, now it's not, it's not that GIMP is bad, but we need Photoshop. If we don't have Photoshop, those design people are up a creek without a paddle and they need to dual boot or have virtual box or something running just to be able to get their day job done. That's just the way it is. We need to deal with it. Same with CAD software. If you do engineering work, you need AutoCAD. You need things along those lines. And there are some packages available, but nothing that they can use in part because it is not the standard that's used um, across the industry. That may be good or bad, but it's just the reality of the situation, and we need to accept that. And I mean, Photoshop's a great example. Everyone brings up Photoshop. If Photoshop were available for Linux, oh yeah, that, I'd buy it. That's the only piece of software for Linux I'd buy, et cetera, et cetera. I've heard that a million times, and it's great. Um, and in order to make that happen, um, it requires a large resource investment. And games. Games are great. I'm just going to skip past this really quickly. There's not a lot of commercial games, and by commercial I mean big games. Open source games are awesome, but it doesn't quite cut it. I mean, I, I love playing, you know, you know, you know, uh, what was it, uh, the bust of move thing, and whatever. Yeah. Yeah, Frozen Bubble, that one. That's great, but it's not, you know what I mean? It's not World of Warcraft, let's be honest. <laughs> so, and, and now I know World of Warcraft runs in wine pretty well. Beautifully. Yeah, but see, that's the thing, is most consumers don't know that. And, most, and we aren't guaranteed that that's going to be the case going forward, because Blizzard, they don't care about you, because they know if you love World of Warcraft, you're going to dual boot, or they, something. They do, they do care enough that they code to the lowest common denominator. Right, right. And so it, right. it'll run on any Windows but system part and of that, any wine. Part of that is because they also developed for the Mac already. Yeah. So anyway, all right, so let's, let's get into the crux of all of these. Let's just group it all together because this is a, these are all huge applications with lots of developers needed, artists, testers, and a lot of stuff. And there have been a lot of attempts at open source projects to address all of these needs. Repeatedly, if you go through SourceForge and FreshMeet, it's ridiculous how many video editors you find alone. It's insane. You'll find 10, 20 video <coughs> editors that, based on the early preliminary screenshots, they look like they could cut it, but none of them can. Um, and it sucks. And now here's the thing. So the time and resources is huge. So how do we, how do we fund these projects? How, how do we actually do it? We, get, we can do open source with donations to the projects. We'll get into it in a second. Um, with corporate funding, which is a good example, um, the best example of that currently is Novell, which some of you may not like Novell a lot, but they've done a lot of funding via, for the most part, hiring people um, that can then work on things like Banshee and Tomboy, F-Spot, these sorts of things, which, of course, that means you have to kind of like mono and whatnot, but they, they funded a lot of things and made a lot of applications possible. Of course, you can do also do open source software with paid services, but that doesn't really work for most applications. If I want a video editor, I don't really need some sort of online service. I just want my freaking video editor right here. Um, and then there's also making it commercial where you sell it um, with source available or with a closed source. I don't really care what the solution is, and we'll get, we'll get into this briefly here. Um, but let's, let's talk about actual raw numbers. Let's take a hypothetical. Let's make a video editor that is on par with Windows Movie Maker, which if you ever use Windows Movie Maker, it's really crappy. It's uh, Microsoft basically put out the lowest common denominator video editor package that kind of sort of works and kind of sort of has effects. Done. Okay, so let's make something like that. Let's say roughly from a project management perspective, we need three developers and one tester working full time for one year and each person earns $75,000 per year. Now again, I don't care where this money comes from or how they get it. I don't care if it's under the table. I don't care if Guido gives it to them in paper bags. But we still need some way to make that happen. So that works out to roughly $300,000 per year for that project work to continue. Um, developers need to eat. So, but why not just spread it out? Why not go the open source model and make it uh, 50 developers? Because, and for anyone who's worked in a development shop, you know, Add throwing more developers at a project <laughs> does not usually make it better. In fact, it usually makes it worse. Um, there is something beautiful to having source available, so people can just hop on in and say, um, thousands of people have their eyes on the kernel code. That helps fix bugs, that helps fix security leaks, but that's very different than saying, who are our core developers working on it? Who owns these features of the project in order to get it done? And in order to get that done, you need to be very realistic. This is how many it's going to take. This is how long it's going to take. And call it good. 
Now, um, now the open source projects that are commercially backed in some way, and this does include the Linux kernel, tend to be the most active and have the most momentum in that they add the most new features, they are the most exciting, and they are the ones that we tend to point to, for the most part, there are exceptions, and oh, this includes OpenOffice, to say, see, people can switch from Linux to, from Windows to Linux. Again, developers need to eat. Um, so look at a quick case study, Ardour. Ardour is a audio editing workstation class package for Linux. It is one of the greatest applications out there for Linux. It is not quite fully there yet for most everyone's needs, but it is pretty phenomenal. The developer of Ardour is just basically one guy for the most part, and he's attempting to work on it full time, so he takes monthly donations. Now this is an application which has no competition on the Linux desktop whatsoever, really and accomplishes stuff that pro packages on Windows and OS X only are slightly coming to, to accomplish. And his monthly donation subscriptions are currently sitting at a little over $2,000 per month. Which if you do the math is about $24,000 a year and if you live around here you know that that's not quite as much as working at McDonald's. So <laughs> if you're a really good developer, you're not going to work for 24,000 a year. I know morality things come into play and you want to give back to open source projects, but the reality is you have to pay your mortgage, you're going to have kids sometimes, etc. because developers need to eat. Um, so how do we fix that, specifically? And not from a general point of view, but very specific. So start from the highest level and move down. So we need to accept that software costs money to make. Even if it's free, even if it's open source, it costs money. So we must do one of two things. We either need to donate to open source projects in the amount roughly equaling what we pay to a commercial project. If we would pay, to, and I'm not saying what they charge, but what we would pay. So if we would pay $200 for every new version of Photoshop comes out, and the GIMP got sat down and said, you know what, not only are we going to make GIMP look uh, more Photoshop friendly, but we're going to match it feature-wise. Which, transparency. Yeah, yeah, the transparencies and different color spaces. There's all sorts of things GIMPs needs to do. But if we said, you know what, we're going to use it and we're going to donate that amount directly to the GIMP project, the GIMP project would be rocking right now. And they, that is a very motivating thing. If they thought, you know what, we could then form a small not-for-profit, keep this co open code, and continue to make this better and better, we then have a viable business model, we then have better software, and things continue to move forward, and we can point to it and say, you know what, we've got the alternative uh, that you need to Photoshop on Windows. Or we need, as Linux users, to be willing to purchase closed source softwares from the big companies, such as Adobe, so even Microsoft, anyone, um, to, and we need to make it vocal. We need to make it out there. We need to say, I just bought this. So that when companies like Adobe look at it, they can say, you know what? This is a viable business model. Let's take our new applications that we're developing and let's make sure from day one they're available for Linux so we can make the money. Because they don't care about Windows, Mac, or Linux. They only care about money. <laughs> and that's just the reality. The problem is, the same is true of open source developers. We primarily care about money because in the end, we like to eat food. <laughs> so, okay, so specifically, how do we do that? Now, all of us can sit in a room and say, this is what we need to do. It won't happen. Maybe, uh, you know, some of us will go home and, and we'll do that. We'll say, you know, we'll donate to the projects that we really think are important. We'll buy a few commercial packages, which are not, there are not many available currently. But, and we will do that, but that's not going to get enough going, and it's not going to be enough of a PR splash to really make it happen. We need the big dogs to get behind it. We need Mark Shuttleworth and the CEO of Red Hat and everybody else to basically come out and say, yes, people need to do this in order to get those sorts of applications that people are saying, you know what, I use Linux, but I can't because. Um, so uh, they, need to, you know, um, they need to encourage people, active fundraisers for those projects, Building software stores into their distros, I know that's uh, like Linspire, but just the same, but uh, maybe not quite as far as that. But you know what I'm saying, where they actively are encouraging their users to be able to do that. Well, no, yeah. So when you talk to Adobe and you say to them, you know, it would be really nice if you made Photoshop <laughs> for Linux. Yep. Which I have. You imply um, that OpenSUSE uses an NTFS file system, and Red Hat uses EXT3, and they say, 
Sure, we could make Photoshop for Linux, but then which distro do we make it for? Right, and that, that is, and honestly, it, that that problem goes away if we have a solidified, simple packaging system. But um, but just the same. But even even that, it goes a step further. Even if we made it simple for Adobe, Adobe's still going to have to stop and say, okay, so we're going to spend three million dollars porting Photoshop to Linux. Are we going to get three point five million dollars for sales? Can we count on that? And if not, they're not going to do it. Um, so, um, so uh, making commercial third-party software more prominent on their websites. Ubuntu.com uh, kind of has a little section like that, but it's like hidden and the black sheep of their website. Um, but they still need to do it. Now, if the major distributions come out and do this, they will never hear the end of it. They will get... Sorry. Um, yeah. I just have one point on this slide. I worked for Mandriva for five years. And Mandriva did all this stuff. I no longer work for Mandriva because yes. they don't make any money because it didn't succeed. So Mandriva kind of screws the pooch, though, in how they did it. And we'll get to that. And, and, and so the, to the, the times are very different. It is, but it is a problem. Yeah, it, it, it is a serious problem. And the backlash will be big. The problem is, now if just, let's say just Ubuntu comes out and does that. It's canonical says, yeah, guys, commercial stuff and all that sort of thing. There will be a flood of people going to other distros. And all of a sudden, people will be using Mint or OpenSUSE. Yeah. It has been done successfully. It has. Um, but it hasn't been creating an application that runs on all these distros. It's the company saying, this is the distro we're going to support. A great example is Oracle right. on Unbreakable Linux, right. where they've said, right this is the thing. But the, 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 the difference is, they're more in, that tends to work more often in the niche space right. away from like a but global consumer desktop. Prosumer level audio editing or video editing is a niche space. It is, but I, what I'm saying is, if you look at when Apple came out with GarageBand, we all knew about it, even if we didn't have a Mac. And the reason is because it was exciting. Oh, great, we get, as an average user, an easy to use and professional level audio editor, right? That looks cool and it's easy. Well, if we have that, that really drives a lot. I mean, it, and it doesn't have to do be a niche at that point. It just becomes the whole center of your digital lifestyle, et cetera, canvas of these are cool things I can do with my Mac that we just wish we could do. Um, so, so there will be a lot of backlash. And to the distros, I just say, man up and do it. Um, all right. So I cut about 80 slides out of this because <laughs> I only have 45 minutes. Feel free. Um, but um, definitely yell at me about this. Because um, I'm not necessarily completely right on all this, but what we need to do is purely pragmatic. How exactly do we fix this problem? And how do we fix it right now uh, in order to get there? And I think these areas will fix it. Do I think the distros will man up and do that? No, not a chance. Do I think it's what they have to do in order to not survive? Because they're surviving fine just now. But even even Ubuntu is looking at it, and Canonical is looking at it. They're like, oh, I don't know about the long-term viability from a money-making potential of desktop Linux. Red Hat's already said desktop Linux will never make money, and they will not get into that market again. So I'm like, OK, that sucks. So maybe let's make it so we can do that. Let's make it so we can adequately fund these open source projects and actually make it a little bit better. That's the basis of what I got to say today. Um, I'm glad a lot of you guys came. I was a little worried that, uh, <coughs> based on the title, a lot of people wouldn't necessarily come. I'm going to go back to the front slide because I like that one the best. <laughs> Do you have any questions? A anything that you'd like to bring up along those lines or any questions for me on this? Yeah? Oh, yeah. I missed most of the talk. I feel really bad. I forgive you. Don't worry about it. But I've been doing Linux desktop we'll have on, later. on the professional level for five years. Yeah. And I gave it to people and it was good for them. Sure. They were IC and TCP designers. Oh, sure. They weren't computer people. So it can be done. I'll have the slides up on, uh, oh, okay. up on my website so you can grab it. Um, desktop Linux wasn't really anywhere 10 years ago. So oh, the advancements. Radically faster than Microsoft or anybody's been, Agreed. especially for a community thing. And, and the way Linux has always been is a developer thing and a freedom-based thing. If you go to the Freedom Software, you know, especially with projects like Alsa and Pulse and all those things. And I know it makes it confusing sure. for desktop users. It does. But there are distributions that try to make it simple and make that thing, that part, visible. Yeah. But developers like to have those things available for their own freedom sake. Which is good. And uh, I think it's just a matter of patience. We don't, don't need all those, we don't need those proprietary apps. I'm right not now. a 
I'm not a, I'm not a big patient guy. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't want to talk much because I wasn't sure what you had to say on this, but there's one point in your talk. Um, when I think about funding work on open source projects, the problem with video editing and audio editing is that companies like Novell and Red Hat hire people who already hack to hack on the things they're hacking on. Yeah. Now, the things with video and audio editing is that it's not the type of stuff that geek hackers tend to be interested in. No, it's not. So they don't start hacking on it. The people and start hacking on it. Now in, first, in order right. to do it very well, exactly. so you need to have experience in audio and video work yeah. and preferably experience developing audio and video related exactly. stuff because so the, the, the challenges are unique. Have the funding, it's stuff that geeks are interested in. It's kernel development, X development. Right. No one wants to, and the other one that is part of it. mobile device support. Because right. geeks don't do it. No one has an they have one, but they don't think that they don't have business contacts. But other people do. I agree. Did you put your site thing back up again? Please. I, I, I like that slide. Very yeah. nice. <laughs> that's just really, really big, and that's inflammatory and fun. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Never I've found a model that worked, is working pretty well. Um, on a small scale form, you know, they they make it easy for companies that have a commercial viable product to make sales through their software. Um, right, it's like things like Amazon, like magazine, like that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that works from a service standpoint. And honestly, there's a lot of great options in there. And a lot of applications can really actively use a services model. Most applications can. That's the whole problem. I use Utado. <coughs> <laughs> That's Richard Dal Stallman's endorsed Linux now. He doesn't endorse Debian. Really? <laughs> yeah. He only uses Emacs. He doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> in the back was talking about the, the products that are the, the, the packages and applications that are sponsored by corporate things. Yeah. What you see like from Novell is the, the projects that they're sponsoring are the projects that are going into their enterprise products. <coughs> yeah. And yeah. at the desktop, you, you see a desktop that does work. From yes. a business perspective, it works. Susan Linux Enterprise Desktop works. It, it works. meets most business desktop needs. And it's fifty bucks, but for the which is, user, it's a very which is leaps and bounds from what you would expect to pay for something equivalent for Microsoft. By the time you get stacking stack in the office suite, so I guess my question is, the other way with it, you're expecting the major distros to to, to step up and change their model. Why isn't there? Why isn't anybody trying to build a, a consumer desktop that competes? The one company did, and they, they went about it in the world's worst PR way, and that was the Lindos guy and Linspire. And they and Mark Carmody and all of them, they really screwed up in how they and how they approached it and how they presented it to people and how they laid things out. And so we just threw rocks at them, basically. Um, and there was Mandriva and now then there's Zandros, and there's a lot of companies that kind of sort of go that way, but they don't go full out and they don't they don't know how to work the marketing angle either. Uh, they just they just have failed in that regard. At least in the American, at least in the Americans, um, which is where it counts. And you were going to talk about the open source build service. Oh yeah, open source build service sucks. Okay, so <laughs> so packaging packaging is a huge problem, right? The open source yeah. guys came up with this great solution. Let's have an online build cloud. I can go in there, create an account, set it up so that my application, whether it's open source or, or whatnot, well. It's supposed to be open source, but anyway. Um, but I can set it up in there and it will build for me packages for a wide variety of distros as I select them. The problem is you still end up having to create your configuration files and whatnot to create your RPMs and your devs per distro. You can't really, it doesn't really get rid of any of the work, but what it does do for you is reduce the need to have a bunch of virtual machines sitting around with different distros. That's about all it does. But in the end, you end up having to say, okay, I made my build. Now I'm gonna upload it to the build service set a bunch of things, wait a while, and I'll, then I'll get the build, and then I'll grab it, and then I'll put it somewhere. Now, technically, for some types of open source projects, you don't need to go through all that, but for a lot of them you do, so it just ends up taking too much time. Well, never mind. It is beta, and it is getting better. It is getting better. It's working. It is getting better. I say stop some love. It is a great idea. And they so so <laughs> 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 if you've done your configuration, <laughs> when you upload your source code, yep. it's going to rebuild for you, and it solves a problem that a lot of people are having Most with, the with popular software anyway. that 
the downloads become too expensive mm. because they're then hosting yeah. the downloaded packages for you. Yeah. And you don't get into a situation like the guy that's doing wine doors. Like wine doors. Well, now wine doors. Yeah, Ford is hosting. I don't know if you guys, you, if you guys use wine and you have a GNOME desktop, wine doors basically allows you to go in and say, um, I want to auto install all the things that make it so that it's almost impossible to use wine out of the box, like the VB runtimes and the virtual C, virtual C runtimes. And it does that all that for you. But if the, he hosts all those files on his own server, open source a build service wouldn't be able to host all those files. He'd still have to have his own. This, it would. That's true. I don't know. That's a little. Yeah. Sorry, I'll, I'll talk to you about this in more detail afterwards. But okay. the take on the packaging thing, if you're expecting third parties to do the packaging, you're looking at the model wrong. Packaging exactly. exists for distributions. Right. I would say to commercial third parties or even other third parties, you don't do your own packaging. If you want to provide software for Linux, provide an installer of which dumps it in Opt. That's fine. Yeah. If you want packages, it's the distribution's job to do packages for you. Provide so your software in a form which a distribution is where you have, um, let's say, because if you get Ubuntu, the whole thing is you get trained to use Synaptic and apt-get. You're trained to do that. That's sure. where your software comes from. Now, if you're releasing um, uh, closed source software, let's say, let's say you're releasing Photoshop. How do you release Photoshop as Adobe and make it so that, Linux, as Linux users, we feel like it's part of our desktop? You release it so that they have their own repository, so that we can just get the updates directly from it. Because it's not part of the Ubuntu repository. No, I agree. You have to end up so exactly, it's which it's never going to be so in, in a lot of those repos. Part of Ubuntu, you talk to Canonical and you get Canonical to do your packaging for you. That's their job. If you want it to just yeah. be a third party yeah. application, provide an installer. Well, they just yeah. have to set up commercial agree. repositories. I agree. And, uh, you're, you're, you're totally right. right. You're yeah. totally yeah. right. It just sucks. It just hasn't been done yet. Change the model, <laughs> that's, that's what it is. So, like, like let's is. say, I've got to identify the um, there's not a lot of commercial software available, but let's say you like the Fluendo Codex, mm -hmm. right? If you're doing video stuff on Linux, you gotta have the Fluendo Codex because, well, if you want to do like WMVHD and these sorts of things, that's really the only way to do it at a reasonable speed and whatnot. Well, now they don't really have a good repo set up to grab their commercial versions from, so every time they do an update and whatnot, it's kind of a pain in the ass to go get them because I'm used to my Linux desktop just auto updating for me because it's awesome. So I want all of it to be integrated well together. I don't want five different ways to install it. That's why I personally hate the fact that there's synaptic and then the add remove things and then every distro is like five places I have to install crap. Like I just want one thing, boom. It's, uh, for gamers like Steam from Valve yeah. and how it delivers apps yeah. and the app store for the iPhone. Exactly. Okay, that's closed source and delivery. It auto updates, you get it, it's just boom, here it is. And, and really, that, and that's something that I think like Linspire was trying to go to with their whole click and run store, where they were trying to integrate it so that they have all the open source packages available, because it's just you know Debian archives on the back anyway. But they also have all the closed source stuff in there too with a store in front of it. The problem is that eh, the implementation wasn't so hot and they presented it kind of weird. And, they had some great ideas, and they actually did a pretty good job, but not enough that it really caught on. Now, Click and Run's still around. Maybe Click and Run will take off, and maybe that will be a solution for a lot of different distributions. It took a while for Steam to like, take off. Game it did. Hated it it came out. But now it's like the but thing. But like, it's great. I don't have keys. I don't have CDs. You just have updates. Yep. But that's it's an interesting cool. example, because Steam is not a Windows update, yeah, like and the App Store is not how you update your iPhone. Yeah, right. so the, no. the update system is separated from the, the, the system software. Yeah. So, so maybe, that's, maybe that's the right approach there. Maybe we have one application that is the commercial software application for all distros. But isn't the shortcoming in that idea that we're talking about, uh, we're, we're comparing Windows Update and Steam and all these um, interconnected updaters that are independent of the system and all these things, but we're, but in, in that context, aren't we only talking about it on one platform, whereas Linux is a whole lot of different platforms because not all tools are, the, are for the same thing? So, I don't know, I, I see one of the previous slides we were talking about, we were, I, was, I was bitching basically about packaging. That was one thing. Honestly, we should have unified pack together. I have this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can talk. Anything else, you guys? RPM sucks. Yeah. RPM does <laughs> suck, right? <laughs> Seriously. Try building an RPM. Try building a jet. I do. I mean, if you go, if you go to my suck. website, you can grab my right? stuff. Yeah, yeah, try I using Gap and see which is easier. I'm getting a little uh, pre-show uh, behind the scenes here. This is a... Uh, this is how Brian prepares for a show right here. This is 